Jeff, what's going on, man? Everything's been great, man. Thanks for bringing me out today to your studio at 1520 Records. I mean, it's speechless for me because I don't seen where y'all started and where y'all ended up at. So, you know, it's always powerful to see people grow and that's just something that I support and I like seeing people win. No, absolutely, man. And I'm, and I'm definitely, I mean, you know, us, we feel grateful to even have you here. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, I know you basically my whole life. So this is actually amazing to actually be able to do this, you know, obviously years later, you know, for my whole life, you think 29, I'm 29 now. So, right. you know, to even have you here and be able to, you know, introduce, um, introduce you to more, even more people, you know, in this world is, uh, that's amazing because people have to hear your story, man. Definitely. You know, um, it's amazing. Um, so just tell me, tell me like how you grew up. Basically, a lot of people think that I'm from the Bronx, but I grew up in Harlem originally on 149th Street between 7th and 8th. Um, back in the 80s where at the time it was like during the crack era. So it wasn't like, even though as a kid, I thought I was living great. As I got older, I realized that I was really in the heart of the beast. And um, you know, so many things could have went wrong that didn't go wrong. And my mother feeling like, well, you know, I'm gonna move somewhere better. And we ended up moving to Highbridge in the Bronx. And then a year later, I ended up getting shot. And, you know, it's, life has a way of, you know, taking you down paths that you never really even imagined. But as bad as it may have seemed, I think that was like one of the things that changed my life and my mindset completely. Yeah, you know, definitely. Being 13 years old, getting shot. Yeah, 13 years old. How, like, like tell, tell us like about that experience. Like, how, how was that, like the feeling? And I think at 13, where your mind is still developing and you really don't even know who you are at the time. Um, it was like real, it was like when, when I first got shot, it kind of had me in a dark tunnel because, you know, even when nothing happens to you, you're trying to figure your future out, you're trying to figure out, you know, the, what you're gonna become in life. And when you get shot and you left paralyzed, laying in a bed looking at a ceiling for nine months, you know, you go through this thing where, you know, you start to feel like life failed you. Like, I didn't really get what I came here for. You know, I kind of felt like, you know, my whole life ended so short. You know, right. I couldn't imagine the things that I would ever not be able to do, like driving, having a family, you know, going to school, you know, everything just, like somebody just cut the light switch out on my life. And I think during those nine months, you know, there's a chapter in my book you know, called Melissa, and there was this seven-year-old little girl that would roll in the room, she was in a wheelchair, and she would always tell me, Jeff, when you think you got it bad, somebody else has it worse. Mm. And I wrote about her in the book because she was really that force in my life to show me that life goes on. You know, my mother told me daily, she always, you know, let me know, like, no matter what the doctor tell you, don't ever let nobody tell you what you can't do. So between my mother instilling that in me and this little seven-year-old girl rolling in my room happy every day and, you know, just her spirit, her energy, she was like an angel to me that just came with that message that, you know, your life didn't really end. You know, you have to find a way, but you still on that path to success. So I just took that energy and I just try to build from there and rebuild my life and fortunately I was able to succeed after that. Yeah, it's amazing, man. And then definitely, man, you know, I'm, I'm really happy that you was able to, you know, overcome the adversity because that's actually, like you said, it's, it make you feel like pretty much like, man, you basically call it a life, basically. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Most people probably just say, oh, my life is over. And the fact that you didn't quit is is amazing, man. It's amazing. Years later, you're definitely. able to tell your story, you know? And I realize you talked a lot about your mom. Um, she must be a great supporter the way you speak yeah, about it. Yeah, definitely. You know. I grew up in a single parent home, so like a lot of people think you succeed because you have that perfect family structure. You know, my father was around, but my mother was still a single parent. And watching how hard my mother worked, you know, for me and my brothers and sisters, it just motivated me within itself because she always basically taught us and raised us to like, you have to be your own solution. 
And when somebody puts that in your mind at a young age, you don't say what you can't do. You start to figure out how can I do it. And being in that wheelchair, it became even more powerful because it was like a math problem. It's, it's a solution, you just have to find it. And I think, you know, being in a wheelchair and being stripped of everything that I took for granted, like walking and all the stuff that I lost when I couldn't walk anymore. And like for most people that, you know, it wasn't even that I couldn't walk, I couldn't even sit up when the, when the accident first happened. So, yeah. you know, I'm laying in the bed and the doctor's telling me like, I won't sit up again, I won't be able to walk again. I mean, walking became secondary because my lungs, both of my lungs had collapsed, so I couldn't even breathe. Wow. So, you know, you, you sit back and, you know, so many things that seem so simple, like standing, like moving your feet, you know, even breathing became something that was a challenge for me. Right. You know, so just, it was just a journey that, you know, every day was like faith and believing in God and having somebody like my mother with that positive message that, you know, you can do it, you know, and you keep going. And when I look at my life now, and compare it to where I was, you know, there's no day that I don't wake up and be proud that I'm in a wheelchair because it's not, that wheelchair became more like a trophy to me for yeah. all that, for that journey and all that dark time that I went through. Absolutely, and it, it's crazy, like, you know, I was thinking back, you know, when you first started mentoring me in 2014, yeah. uh, I remember we was at the gas station and, um, you know, got out the car and, you know, he was like, give me the car to, you know, pay for the gas. And I remember the guy rolled up on a wheelchair yeah. next, you know, next to me, and he was like, "Hey man, you got a dollar?" You know, uh, and he's like, "Ah oh, man, you know, right now I have no cash." And he's like, "Ah oh, man, you just don't understand, man. Right. You just don't understand." And I remember he was like, "Mike, just touch my wheelchair real quick." Went to the back, popped it open, and the guy just started crying. Like, yeah, and that was that was a touching moment for me because it it goes to show you that people always judge what they see and never really know who's behind what they looking at. And yeah. the fact that that wheelchair was in the trunk of the car and he rolled up with a story that he felt like I didn't understand and I lived the same story he lived. I just did something about it. He chose to feel sorry for himself. Yeah. And that really was the only difference between me and him wasn't the fact that he had a disability. It was the fact we both had a disability and it's like real life. Some people do something about it and some people talk about it. Absolutely. And the fact that I did something about it changed the trajectory of my life versus his life. And the only th message I wanted to leave him with is don't ever think that you're the only person with a story. We all have a story. Sometimes even people that don't have disabilities, they have a story. You just can see the physical damage in me. I can't see it in you, but it's there. So that was really what touched me about the story. And I knew when I saw him crying that he realized that I have the same story you had. And it probably bothered him that he didn't really, he had the choice to do something about it and he didn't. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it was very um, inspiring. Trust me, um, when I seen it, like for me to be able to see that, that's too, you know, usually you don't really see, or well, my normal life or most people's daily lives, you don't really see people in wheelchairs, you know, in the same place at the same time, right. you know? So it was kind of amazing to even see that, like that was just a unique moment. No, it wasn't nobody really there, it was right. just us three, you know, and for me to see that in person, it was very inspiring, you know, and um, it just lets me know sky's the limit, you know Definitely. what I'm saying, you know, so. But what is something that you wanted to do before this accident happened? Justice for people. And when I was in John Jay College, I had a mock trial and I ended up beating the case, but it was like a rape victim. And because of the loopholes in the law, I was able to beat the case. When I beat that case, the personal side of me, you know, and my conscience made me change my direction. I really didn't want to be a criminal lawyer because I felt like I couldn't sleep at night knowing I beat a case for somebody who actually committed a crime like that. Right. right. So it kind of shifted gears for me and I started studying corporate law. So I ended up going to Adelphi University and studying corporate law right. and landed a job at a Fortune 500 company. And I started in their mailroom and worked my way up to their legal department because I had to switch from criminal law to corporate law. Um, but 
I love the whole transition of it. And like when I watch movies like Lincoln Lawyer and things like that, it kind of make me miss the fact that I didn't do it. But at the same time, I, I didn't really want to be a great lawyer knowing that subconsciously I didn't really feel good about what I was doing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So tell me, like, what, what is, like, your first love? I love helping people, and I love changing people's lives. And what happened when I first got in a wheelchair, and, you know, I had to make a decision, like, I, at some point, you know, after rehab, and, you know, the doctor's telling me I'm going home. I really didn't know what that looked like. And I remember the first day when I went home, you know, the whole nine months in the hospital, I'm like dying to go home. But home wasn't what it was before I left. Because right. when I was home before I left, everything was accessible. I was able to walk around the house, things like that. And I remember the first night I was getting ready to go to bed and my mother was like, go take a bath. And when I rolled to the bathroom door and realized my wheelchair wouldn't fit through the door. And I think that's that reality that hit me like, wow, like, you know, you wanted to come here so bad yeah. and you're not really welcome here no more. You know, uh -huh. the house didn't welcome me home. Yeah. You know, so I rolled back to the room and I sat on the bed and crawled on the floor and got a towel and slid to the bathroom. So I had to like crawl inside the door and lift myself up on the toilet and the tub. And it was like, when I sat in the tub, and I cut the water on, tears just start running out my eyes because I'm like, like I just was reduced to, to this, you know what I'm saying? And I just felt defeated. You yeah. know, I felt like, you know, where did my life go wrong at? You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. you know, you never think about, you know, even though I was able to get in the tub and get out, I just, the whole process was just totally changed for, for something that I did so easily every day. Right. And, you know, just sitting in that tub thinking about the new me and where do I go from here? It's just my first obstacle. What else is next? What's coming down the line? You right. Know? So when I got out the tub, I had to slide back to the room to get back to the chair. And I remember my mother coming by my room door. She peeked in the room and she saw that I had came out the tub. I got dressed by myself. And to her, it was like a great accomplishment. I still had it stuck in my head, that process that I had to go through. She looked at it like, she was like, wow, Jeff, I'm proud of you. You know, you did all of that by yourself. Yeah. And I stopped crying because I realized at that moment I had accomplished something. Right. You know, I had basically overcome a challenge. Yeah. And that was like the start of like, you know what? I have to look at things differently. I'm in a tub crying, thinking about what I'm going through instead of thinking about what I accomplished, right. not being able to walk. So yeah, it was different. Yeah, it seemed degrading, but at the same time, it was something that, you know, I overcame. Absolutely. Which made it great and not bad. So I smiled about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, 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 that's amazing. And, and so how, how long were you, were you at the job? Um, you said you started at um, Melvin. Yeah, I started in 1995. I've been there like 26 years. Oh, yeah, that's a long time. Man. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's crazy because, you know, I look at like today's time, and, you know, we, we I'm sure you hear the same things. It's like, oh, man, there's no jobs out there. They're not hiring. And, and you know, people people just necessarily like always make excuses. And, like, somebody like you can hold a job for 26 years. And yeah. this is way before COVID where you can work from home exactly. and things like that, you know. So, just not making the excuses, I think, is just is very inspiring. What's, a, what's amazing about the job piece that you're mentioning, um, you know, not just COVID, but when I started working, um, the America Disability Act wasn't even enacted yet. So okay. I didn't even have that on my side. So I remember years ago doing a New York Times article on, you know, finding a job, a job seeker with a disability was the title of this article. and. Basically, they, they were saying to me, like, when you go for a job interview, how do you know you didn't get the job because of you had a disability or you just didn't have the skill set? And back then, I didn't have that leverage. I didn't have that bridge. Like, the ADA wasn't working on my behalf to say that you have to give me a fair interview. 
So when I went on an interview, or I went on a couple of interviews, and all I would ever ask the person who was interviewing me is to judge me on my skills and not what you see. Yeah. Because it's so much more than me than me sitting in a wheelchair. Yeah. And when I landed my job at this Fortune 500 company, they saw me for who I was and not for what they saw in that wheelchair. Oh, I love that. And what's powerful, like working over throughout those um, 26 years, even though I started in a mail room, it was something that I think was good because it made me work harder. It made me go harder. And, you know, even in snowstorms, I came to work because it wasn't just about me. It was about if I don't set the right example, it's going to make it harder for the next person that comes in here with a disability because if I make them believe in me, if I show them that not only do I have a disability, but I'm going to go just as hard as your employees that don't have a disability, it's going to pave a road for everybody that comes behind me with a disability. Yeah, no, I love it. I love the same example. Yeah, man, and um, you say you was from Harlem. Like, when was you, like, first, like, introduced to hip-hop? Well, back in maybe 89, 92, somewhere around there, um, when I moved to the Bronx, and I had a friend in the Bronx, his name was Ade, and he was a rapper, right? And he had this rhyme that he would always say to me called Coca Man. I'll mm -hmm. never forget it because he was like a super lyricist to, lyricist to me because I liked how he rhymed. So every time I saw him, I would say, Yo, rhyme for me. <laughs> yeah. He would do these rhymes for me. And, you know, I was like fascinated with him. Like, and I would say, Coca Man, rhyme for me. <laughs> every time he, every time he see me, like, Jeff, I said that rhyme already. I said, yeah, but I like how you say it. Say it again. Do it again. <laughs> yeah. And I would literally have him do this rhyme every time I see him. And then I knew at the time he would be with a lot of rappers, you know, a lot of main rappers that was coming up at the time. And my brother and I, we had a game room and a barbershop in the Bronx. And, you know, he called me one night and he's like, Jeff, you know, I got this battle that we need to do and I want we need a location. You think we could do it at the game room? So my brother, I called my brother and I'm like, you know, they wanna wanna meet me to do this battle. I said, yeah, definitely. You know, anything you need, I'll do it for you. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll let you do the battle if you say the rhyme for me. <laughs> <laughs> so he comes to the, to the Bronx and he gets there and he's with Dame Dash. And mm -hmm. I'm like, all right. And then, uh, just to name a few people, like Big L was there, um, Original Flavor was there, um, and I'm like, well, who's battling? I didn't really know who the battle was, so everybody started coming, all the kids in the game room in the neighborhood over on Webster, 169th and Fulton, we over there, and I, the name of the shop was Uptown Jump Around, so we standing there, and it got crowded, so I really couldn't see. So I said, they said, well, I said, look, put the rappers on a pool table. Yeah. So him, Lamont, and a couple of my friends, they lift me up on a pool table. So I'm sitting in the middle of the pool table waiting for the two people to get on. And then I see Jay-Z come in, so he's on this side of me, and then DMX come in, and he's on this side of me. That's crazy. And it's like, it was just a legendary moment, you know what I mean? And, yeah. You know, I wrote about it in the book, so if you purchase the book, it's inside the book. Absolutely. But um, I'm gonna just save that story for another time because we're working on, you know, putting it out there, and I want to, because our day made the phone call, and he's really the one that made it happen. Yeah. I wouldn't want to do it without him, so I want to make that part of something we do later. Absolutely, man. Shout outs to him, man. Yeah, for that, sure. That one phone call led to exactly. To history, you know, so I, I, I love that. I love that Definitely. a lot. Man. So, and around what, what, what time frame was that? Like, what year? Because I know you was doing a lot of- I think that was around 1990. Oh, 1990. The original battle. Wow, so, I wasn't even, yeah. it's crazy because I wasn't even born yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so exactly. it's, it, it's just it's just amazing, like, you know, how, like for you to be able to even tell this story, like this is literally over 20 years, you know, yeah. and, and for you to be around and at that moment. And it's crazy because I know that that whole um, event was like exclusive. 
Definitely. You know what I'm saying? It's not something that everybody is at. That's just something that basically is a he say, she say on what happened that day. Right. You know it's, what I'm saying? It's interesting because I recently spoke to our day and we was laughing because I seen it go on Instagram one day. Somebody was talking about it on Instagram. And when I saw it on Instagram and a couple of people was talking about it and I saw some footage of a game room and they was like, you know, reenacting this battle. But because I own the game room with right. my brother, I knew that wasn't the real game room right. in the footage. Gotcha. Um, but I would rather that story be told because it needs to be told. Absolutely. But it needs to be told by the people that was actually there. Exactly. And I feel like it's such a great part of history that the people that was there need to properly tell the story because to this day, nobody can really tell you who won that battle because of the controversy between the battle. And some of the people that was there, like myself, yeah. I even know the actual rhyme Jay-Z said the day of that battle. Wow. And our day can confirm that because we, was, we wasn't just witnesses. I was in the middle of both of these rappers. Right on the pool table. On the pool table. That's crazy. You know, I mean, they have some footage in a, in a movie called Backstage in the beginning of the movie. You right. could actually see a piece of the wheelchair in the video yeah. and both of them on each side of me. Um, but it was an epic moment and to see who both of these rappers have become yeah. and to know that I was a part of that history all through this phone call from my friend out there is just priceless. So, you know. It's amazing, it's man. It's amazing to me, yeah. Yeah, no, it's definitely amazing. And so tell me more about like your book. Um, I know you, when did you drop the book? During COVID, I was in the house, and I'm really not used to being still that long, but I don't like wasting time because it's like you said, people make excuses and say what they can't do. I always look at what can I do better? How can I improve myself daily? So while I was sitting there, I thought about all these years I wanted to write this story because I witnessed a lot of things. I experienced a lot of things and you know, my life, and I just felt like it was a story that could change people's lives, and I wanted you know, if something ever happened to me, not to die with this in my head. I wanted to, to release this story. Um, and telling your life story, it puts you in a vulnerable position because you're opening the door to the world about your personal life. But if my personal life can change somebody else's life or motivate them or inspire them, it's something that needs to be told and it's something that I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so during COVID, I started writing a book and I was fortunate enough to have other authors that had books out to kind of mentor me and guide me and give me information that would make my book great. Right. And I had an editor, her name is Nilsa Crosby, and she had a writing course. So I took the writing course and I worked with her like every day. We would spend a couple of hours, you know, going over writing styles, writing, you know, um, better ways to write writing with more detail and things like that because right. I wanted to work with somebody that was going to help me perfect the craft yes, to the absolutely. point that when you read this book, I can actually put you in the story. Right. And I've been fortunate from the people that I've sold the book and the reviews that I got from the people who read the book that, you know, I was able to pull those emotions, whether they some of them laughed, cried, or they did all three in, in, in reading the book. And you know, to be able to touch your audience that way. And, you know, it's not really how many sales I made or how much money I made from the book, but it's more, I'm more touched when somebody actually gets to meet me in person and they read the book and they come back to me and say, you know what, that book changed my life. You right. know, your, your tragedy helped, helped somebody else. Absolutely. So, no, it, it, it did a lot for me as well um, when I read the book. And like I said, I know you my whole life. and. Um, it is crazy how you can actually know somebody your whole life and still be missing details. Definitely. You know, yeah. emotions, how you felt and you know, I, I definitely just advise all people to get the book. It's it's inspiration no matter if you're in a wheelchair definitely. or not. You know, yeah. it's amazing. So I you know, I got one last question for you. You know, if you had to go back in time and change one thing, you know, what would that be? Well, most people when you ask people if you could go back in your life and change something most people who have a disability would probably, people in the audience would expect you to say, I would not be in this wheelchair. 
Um, as crazy it may seem to most people, this wheelchair experience has been the best thing that ever happened to me because I honestly don't believe I would t have touched the lives that I've touched in this wheelchair if I was walking. Not that I was a bad person, but I didn't have the insight. This accident, me laying in a bed nine months, me losing the ability for every bodily function, my hands, my legs, everything. I mean, to not have control of my body and not have control of myself, um, to be able to live this journey, master it, become successful in it, it speaks volumes for who I am and how far I've come. And I think that's more powerful than me ever walking, you know? And to prevent somebody, like when I go to schools and I do speeches and I have 10 kids come to me and say, I was contemplating suicide, but yeah. after hearing your story, I wanna live. Yeah. Because I wanted to kill myself for something less. You know, even the person who shot me, I forgave them. Yeah. Me forgiving them, you know, and teaching other people and setting that example of forgiveness was something else that I found to be very powerful because through forgiveness, you learn a whole lot about yourself. And if we was in a forgiving world, then things would be a lot better. Absolutely, I totally yeah. agree with you. How, how long How long did it actually take for you to, to forgive him? Well, initially, because I looked at it like this, when I first got shot and both of my lungs had collapsed, had he panicked and just left me there, I'd end up dying. The fact that he was able to react quickly and he was able to pick me up, run me outside, he was on a fifth floor walk up and he carried me downstairs to the street to a cab. And him thinking fast, and him and my brother was with me, um, him thinking fast, even though he shot me, he also saved my life. Wow. And it's real odd because people say, how can you be friends with somebody that shot you? Um, he also introduced me to the person who I had my son with. Wow. You know, so it's almost like they say God work in mysterious ways. Somebody takes so much from you, and me having my son was a blessing. So it's like I got that back. Yes. And through my son, I walk again. So that's amazing. It's man. a powerful situation. Bro. Man, you're the powerful situation. <laughs> <laughs> But let's say any special shout outs you know you want to give you know before we i want to thank everybody that i see every day that support me indirectly or directly anybody that ever pushed my chair took me to school took me outside when i wasn't able to do it for myself because when people look at me and they say jeff you're great you know it's just like a cake that tastes good it comes with a lot of ingredients and all these people around me are the ingredients that make me great so I never take that credit for myself. Yeah. All those ingredients, all those good people, all those great things that people have done for me is what made me successful. So I want to thank all of y'all. I love it. I love it, man. I, and I definitely want to thank you, you know, for, you know, mentoring me, you know, starting in 2014, man, you did a lot for me. And this is a big part of why 5020, you know, actually even exists is because you changed my mindset in 2014. You know, so I definitely want to always thank you. I'll be thanking you for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, thankful was to see you succeeding, to see you having fifteen twenty, to see you being a real estate um, yeah. broker agent. I mean, I remember the day when you started. I remember sitting up at three o'clock in the morning practicing the test with you. And yeah, you know, like people always say, "What do somebody owe you?" All you owe me is to do it for somebody else. Because if you do it for somebody else and they do it for somebody else then those, it's like we set a trend on helping each other and not holding each other back. Exactly. And that's more powerful to me than any amount of money. Absolutely. And trust me, I'm passing it on as we speak. Thank you. I uh, appreciate <laughs> you, Jeff. Pleasure. Definitely, All man. Right.